Good morning. I'm Rick Crosker. I'm an internist here locally, and it's my honor to introduce you to Dr. Eugene Firth. Um, I think a slide is going to be coming up. It's not on the screen. What do I do? Actually, it's more. Experiencing technical difficulties. Plug in projector. Ah, there we go. Gene was a lifelong scholar, a dedicated teacher, skilled healer, an astute administrator, respected leader, an innovative scientist, and the very best of colleagues. His educational work history is listed here, and I just want you to note he went back into training as a fellow in geriatrics after he had been chair of our department for 10 years, a lifelong learner. He's the reason I'm here. In 1980, when I was a senior medical student at The Ohio State University, I told our chair, Dr. Calvin Kunin, of my plans to make a trip south to interview at MCV and UNC and Bowman Gray. And he said, well, there's a brand new program down there at East Carolina, and the chair there trained with me at Cornell. He's a great guy, and I'm sure he's putting together a good program. So why don't you go down there and look at it and come back and tell me about it? Well, I, I liked it. I matched. Here I am. I hear stories like mine all the time. In, in addition to residents like me, Gene recruited faculty who never left. For instance, uh, Harry Adams. Okay, get off of there. I went back one. There we go. We residents pictured Dr. Firth in the days of yore. He's on the left there probably carrying tubes of blood in his pocket of his barber shirt, identifying dyslipidemias by visual inspection, working 72-hour shifts in gloomy institutions where they use lightning rods to power their experiments, having to work Christmas in the wards with the nurses and the lab rats. But he was a great example to us in clinical medicine also. For instance, he took service call just like everyone else. His wife Mary told me he hated the monkey suit, and on evenings like this was glad to have an excuse to go to the emergency room. He made time to relax and have fun too. Everyone looked forward to the first annual pig picking. For most of us, it was our introduction to this peculiarly East Carolinian ritual, a convivial gathering of faculty, private practice, and physicians in training. And every summer they had a Department of Medicine sailing regatta with the house staff serving as crew on the faculty's boats. The morning report with Dr. Firth is the highlight of your training, where the house staff discusses each day's admissions, resuscitations, and deaths. We learned there were not only successful and unsuccessful resuscitations, but sometimes successful deaths. Whether we ended up in general practice like I did or in subspecialties, private practice or academics, Firth trained physicians learned the satisfaction of listening to and examining the patient and processing the clues in our computers to make the correct diagnosis and put that diagnosis into the context of the patient's life. We also learned the science of medicine was important, and even if we didn't have the pedigree of Harvard or Duke, we could have our own research day, so we started one. Here are a few first pearls. Patient comes first, doctors should teach, there's joy in patient care. Dr. Firth was not just the chair of the of medicine, but also teaching faculty in his specialty, shown here contributing to gland research in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism. And as the chief, faculty often called upon him at his office to request space, resources, staffing, or funding, and were handled in his unique way, such as being directed to the prayer bench. My recently retired partner, Rob Turner, told me that Dr. Firth could attentively hear your request tell you no, and escort you out so skillfully you actually felt good about it. That's just the kind of man he was, a friend to all, great and small. I called him a few years ago to ask him if he would be willing to be nominated to succeed me as president of the Pitt County Medical Society. I was pretty nervous asking my mentor and someone of his stature to take on yet another responsibility. But he said, Rickery, how could I say no to you? You've done so much for our community. And he went on to serve the Medical Society uh, as president with distinction. He loved medicine. 
his students, his residents, his staff, his faculty, and his community. And with fondness and respect, so we remember his legacy in this lectureship. A few years ago when uh, the Mary downsized their house, she invited me to have a few of Jean's books, and I selected a couple that are in my library. In celebration of today's lecture on the uh, treatment of hypothyroidism, I would like to donate this one back to the division. This is Gene Firth's copy of the World Health Organization, 1960, on endemic goiter. Gene's favorite word. <laughs> there you go, Al. Thank No, no, I'm trying to get the introductory slides. Dr. Hunter, if you could help me just a second, because it should have popped up, but it didn't come in the right order. I'm going to just minimize that. Right. Bring up the... yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning. It is both my pleasure and honor to introduce our 2014 Firth Lecturer, Dr. Muhammad Shakir. Dr. Shakir and I go quite a ways back. I, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Shakir as my mentor for these past uh, 25 years, and I still consider Dr. Shakir my mentor and probably the best that, uh, that, that there's, there's been. Um, Dr. Shakir did his early training in India. He came to the United States, did his internal medicine residency in New Jersey, and then did fellowships in endocrinology with the National Institute of Health both in Little Rock, Arkansas, and then at John Hopkins University. Dr. Shakir came into the military and has since then held numerous academic positions in the military, including being the Division Chief of Endocrinology at Bethesda Naval Hospital for many years and the Program Director, where he trained and mentored a whole generation of endocrinologists for both the military and uh, individuals who've gone out into civilian practice since that time. And that's a very important contribution. But Dr. Shakir currently serves as the consultant staff for the Division of Endocrinology at the National Military Medical Center, now called the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, since they've combined the institutions. And he's also a professor of clinical medicine at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. Dr. Shakir has won numerous awards, but I want to mention a couple that are, that, are, that are quite notable. One, he is a Master of the American College of Physicians and a Master of the American College of Endocrinology, and has been recognized as Teacher of the Year by the uh, American College of Physicians. Dr. Shakir has a, a, a long list of publications, uh, a couple of which are listed here. I want to mention the fact that also over the past 12 years, very pertinent to the talk today, he's been heavily involved in important research at the National Military Medical Center looking at T4 thyroid hormone replacement versus combined T4 and T3 replacement, and also investigating T4 replacement versus armor thyroid extract replacement, which has opened some new questions about thyroid hormone replacement therapy. And without further ado, Dr. Shakir is going to present to us today hypothyroidism and controversies in treatment. Welcome, Dr. Shakir. Thank you. Good morning. Th thank you for uh, your kind words, Dr. Drake. And it's an honor and privilege to be here. And before I start my lecture, I had to tell one story about Dr. Drake. Hope you don't mind. <laughs> now, you all know him as a professor and a big person here. And uh, fr one Friday evening around 6.30 or 7 o'clock, Friday, I got a consult to see a osteoporosis patient with some spinal uh, osteoporotic fractures. 
So I asked Dr. Drake, do you mind going and seeing patient? Of course, I will go and see. And it was 7 o'clock. I waited till 8.30, 9 o'clock. He still is with the patient. So I go there, walk, and then he was doing complete neurological examination on this patient, pinprick, vibration, and all those things. So I asked, why you had to do all these things? Just osteoporosis. Oh, no, I had to do a complete physical examination. And this is Dr. Drake. 9.30, 10 o'clock. And I, he's the only one. Of course, in the military in those days, we can order the fellows to do a lot of, it is not the 80 hours. <laughs> so we can order a lot of things. So he's the only one I had to practically order two days a week, working days. Please go home by 6 o'clock. <laughs> Because he's there till 9 or 10 o'clock in the night, all the time. And uh, by 3 o'clock or 3.30 in the afternoon, one good thing I still miss him is he brings green apples. And then he peels them very nicely, cut into pieces, keep it on his table. And I used to go around 3.30 and sneak in and get two or three pieces. <laughs> now I don't get any more of that. So today I'm going to talk on hypothyroidism. And... Uh, and this is, do you know where this is? Can, which country? Anyone? Pardon? Tibet. Tibet. This is in Tibet. And so this is the uh, Winter Palace of Dalai Lama, who, who was kicked out uh, by the uh, communists in China. And he's in India right now. And this is the uh, Winter Palace. And there are about 634 steps to go all the way. So I was planning to go up, then I asked him, if I get a MI, what happens? <laughs> Sir, you have to be carried back on a wheelchair or a, on a chair or a stretcher. So I changed my mind. <laughs> so, so this is the Shangri-La, and there's a book called Lost Horizon. If any one of you have read, it is a very nice book. And it's written by James Hilton, and they made a movie, 19... Uh, 33 and uh, again another movie in 1973 and this is everlasting life once you go to Shangri-La. So there are some anti-aging, in fact there is a board for anti-aging medicine now. I think it is run by from California, green growth hormone, <laughs> all those things. So could you do this everlasting with thyroid hormone treatment? Not necessarily, but still this is one of the earliest pictures of uh, hypothyroidism. And when you treat it, there's some hair growth and there's some rejuvenation. But don't expect this to happen in all your patients. And this is another one, serial old picture. You can see the hypothyroidism developing and you can see the puffy eyelids, loss of the lateral one third of the eyebrow the coarse hairs and all those things. Now my talk today is going to involve in the causes, treatment, some aspects of the history, history of thyroid hormones, then desiccated thyroid extract, and finally future possibilities. So this is a very, very common disease. The prevalence is around 4%. It's more common in women than men, around 4 out of 1,000. Whereas in men, it is about 6 out of 10,000. And liver thyroxine is the most common prescribed after aspirin and simvastatin in the United States. So it's a very, very common drug. So how good are the symptoms of hypothyroidism? They are very bad, really. In fact, one of my own family members, I miss the hypothyroidism. I think Dr. Beck <laughs> knows who it is. I felt so bad. So <laughs> the sensitivity of the symptoms is around uh, 4%. Uh, 2.9 to 25 percent. If you have more symptoms, uh, you know, there are more increased symptoms. So even if it is absent, you know, you cannot exclude it. We have seen pilots, we have seen commanding officers coming with TSH of 60, 70, 90, missed the diagnosis. And the symptoms are non-specific. And if you go and ask the patient, I don't know about the Washington area compared to here. All, all the Washington area patients have fatigue. And I stopped asking the question, fatigue. Do you have fatigue? <laughs> you have the document, then you have to work up that. So I stopped doing all that work up. And so you really have to do the diagnosis. And I personally believe TSH is the best way to make the diagnosis 
Uh, you know, you can ask all the questions you want. You cannot make a clinical diagnosis. This is one area I don't think clinical medicine is very good. You don't have to agree with me. So, few definitions. Overt primary hypothyroidism is elevated TSH and low free T4. And subclinically is elevated uh, TSH, normal T4. 95% of the normal healthy adults have TSH levels between 1 and 2.5. Only 5% is on the low side, 5% is on the high side. And there's a shift of this in the elderly population. And uh, I'm going to come to that a little bit. In people over the age of 65, you shift to the right. So. If you have a 75 or 8 year old person, TSH up to 7.58 is normal for them. And don't treat an elderly person with a TSH of 8 unless very strong antibodies are positive or low free T4. And genetic factors can also affect TSH. In fact, that's one of the things we were, uh, Dr. Drake was doing some studies at the academy, doing bone densities. We were planning to look at the TSH uh, over a couple of years, and we didn't completely do all the workup. Is each one of us have their own TSH, and that's the way it is maintained. Well, it's different, and I think probably this is the genetic influence is doing that. Now, do you know who this is? I don't think you'll remember that. This is the famous Dr. Calvin Clint, uh, Kentel and who got the Nobel Prize in 1950 for uh, inventing adrenocortical hormones. And once he invented all rheumatoid arthritis patients got the steroids. And he's only, uh, you know, he's a PhD. And he was in Mayo Clinic. He synthesized the thyroxine crystals at the age of 28 years. And at 65, he then moved to Princeton and he died in 1972. So again, the, the history is, remember Kentel crystallized at the age of 28 years. Murray is the first one to inject thyroid uh, hormone. That's a sheep, a sheep thyroid gland extract. Only in 1952, Gross and River identified the T3, 1958. So this is the first paper by Murray, and it is published in 1891. He took the sheep thyroid gland and then uh, mixed with glycerin and uh, carbolic acid. Do you know what is carbolic acid? That's a phenol, phenol. And then that's the way you sterilize it. Then inject it between the loose skin of the back between the shoulder blades. It's a convenient situation to make the injection. And carbolic acid is very, very painful. It's like injecting uh, alcohol into subcutaneously. So you can imagine. But the patient felt much better. So normal thyroid gland has 200 micrograms of thyroid hormone per gram of the tissue and approximately 15 micrograms of T3. And the circulation ratio of the two hormones do not uh, represent what is in the thyroid gland. Interestingly, 80% of the thyroid T3 is made in the liver and some from the intestine and the kidney, 80%. 20% comes directly from thyroid gland. So if you look at it, normal human body don't do these things without a very good cause. And uh, I think we are not smart enough sometimes to figure it out. And there is a reason why the thyroid secretes 20%. So when you give T4, you expect the liver to mimic this one. So that 20% contribution from the thyroid gland is gone. A lot of times when you do not know, you think, you know, that's the way it is. And for example, if you look at the textbook of physiology, written, uh, edited by Weston Taylor in 1960s, the mention lymphocytes very clearly says lymphocytes are circulating cells with no known function. <laughs> so you can imagine about that. So this is the structure, and usually we use thyroxine sodium. Uh, that's the one in synthroid because that's soluble. Pure thyroxine is very difficult to dissolve. This is some of the synthetic one, and uh, T4 is the one used. 70 to 80% is absorbed in the small intestine. Half-life is six days, 
80% I mentioned comes from peripheral conversion. And usually the level is very steady state. And these are the two uh, pathways. This is the T4 is converted to, if you remember, two D1 and T2 enzymes are the one activates. And you activate the compound. And D3 is the one which uh, inactivates the enzymes. And this D2 and D1 are the most important one to activate, and that probably determines some of the functions of how patients are doing it. And this is the uh, uh, Tang Dynasty built this fort in uh, China. I visited uh, Xi'an for an endocrine meeting there. And Camelis, one thing they were very smart is they did not destroy a lot of things. You know, compared to, I think in Soviet, they destroyed a lot of things compared to here. And this fort is very beautiful, really. And this is the terracotta barriers. There is, this is all built uh, and kept uh, in a museum. It is in the same place. Amazingly, if you take out these soldiers out of this place, they go downhill very fast. And you have to keep in that place. That's the only way you can preserve them. And this is, again, a plasma TV on the roof of a shopping mall. And you can see that fish swimming on the top. It's amazing technology. And this is, then I went to Tibet, and this is the lake in Lahasa, around uh, 17,000 uh, feet high. And fortunately, I didn't get mountain sickness. So, usually you can give oral thyroxine for all the patients, and also you can give it for uh, hypothyroidism due to surgery. And average dose is 1.6 to 1.7 micrograms per kilogram body weight. And thyroid hormones exert the effects by crossing the cell membrane, binding the nuclear, uh, nucleus, and affecting the gene transcription of messenger RNA. And uh, effects of grapefruit juice on the absorption of thyroxine. Uh, you have endocrine fellows who can answer this question, what happened with grapefruit juice? And you have to tell me the mechanism, why? Who can answer that? Dr. Drake, you are the chief. So you, the, the fellows are not answering. Okay. <laughs> so if you look at the clear uh, empty circles, that's the one with uh, uh, thyroxine taken with water. The absorption is fairly good. The dark circles is with the grapefruit juice. So there is a decrease if you take it with thyroxine, grapefruit juice. Interferes with the absorption. And the mechanism is the transporters. There are several transporters, like organic anion tra transporting polypeptides, and there is a sodium torocolate uh, co-transporting peptides, monocarboxylase, and actually grapefruits affects one of these transporters, this uh, organic anion transporting polypeptide. That's its effect. Cyclosporin also affects it. So this is something very important and interesting to know that. So I will go through some of the pharmacokinetics, and this is renal insufficiency, there's a reduction in total T4, uh, total uh, and free T3, free, free T4 is less affected. Sevil liver disease, total T4 and free T4 may be elevated, total T3 may decrease. And soybean, papaya, grapefruit juice, and coffee can interfere with thyroxine absorption. So coffee, that's important to remember it. Site of absorption is in the jejunum and ileum. Bioavailability is 70-80%. Tmax is 2 to 3 hours. And if you look at it, almost all the T4 and T3 are bound. T4 is half-life. T half-life is 6 point days in euthyroid patients, prolonged in hypothyroid. And for T3, it's only one day, 1.4 in hypothyroid patients. Pregnancy. We all know that as soon as you get pregnant, thyroid binding globulin goes up and the T4 level, total T4 level goes up. And there is an increase of thyroid hormone protection by 20 to 40 percent in pregnancy. And this is the reason why pregnant patients who are hypothyroid, you have to increase the thyroid hormone by 40 percent. And we usually do it by giving two extra pills per week. That is, if they are taking, say, 100 micrograms every day, uh, instead of the seven tablets, we double the dose on Saturday and Sunday. And 
obesity. This is something very interesting because you have a very good department doing a lot of bariatric surgery. TSH could be elevated and this is the leptin has some action on the pituitary gland and leptin interacts with the TSH and TSH may be elevated without uh, detecting thyroid antibodies in this patient. So it is not an uh, autoimmune disease. And that may be something very interesting, you know, if you have C they follow some patients in pediatric surgery before and after looking at thyroid functions. And free, T4 can be up or down depending on which review you read. I mentioned again, the elderly population, the metabolism of T4 and T3 are reduced and reverse T3 increases. T4 half-life is uh, prolonged, 9.3 days. H. pylori and uh, absorption, lactose intolerance, atrophic gastritis, IBD, all this can affect. So if you have problems, we usually look at these patients, we do check for celiac disease, some of these patients. And these are the drugs. TSH secretion is affected by octreotide, glucocorticoids, and dopamine. All these three drugs are used in the ICU setup. So usually I tell the fellows best is not to check thyroid functions. Yes, if you check, then it's a big problem. Central hypothyroid, so all those things. And lithium iodine, all this, you know that. And in this, other absorption, cholesteramine is one drug. And we have done some work on cholesteramine. And actually, cholesteramine can be used in some patients with Graves' disease. And also for iatrogenic hyperthyroidism. For example, 300... Uh, uh, 50 milligrams of cholesterol can bind to 3,000 micrograms of T4. There's an enterohepatic circulation. So it's a very good drug. You can use it as long as they can stand constipation and nausea associated with the use of this drug. And all the other drugs, you all know, I'm not going to go through this list. Each time I had to look at it and remember. Amiodarone is a very common drug, and cardiologists use it, and they produce the hyperthyroidism, then they are referred to us, and we are stuck with those patients. Very, very difficult to treat these patients. And again, if you look at this, the dose is usually hydrocortisone, more than 100 milligrams per day, and frucimide is high dose can do it, affect thyroid functions. So usually there are several preparations. One is synthetic thyroid or sodium thyroxine, and it comes in different uh, trade names, synthroid, levoxyl, and generic version, T3 or cytomel, and there's a combination of T4 and T3, that's the thyroid lab, and finally desiccated thyroid extract. And uh, soft gel capsules is a tyrosine. Tyrosine is also available in other countries as drops, which you can use for pediatric patients, and also in solution form. <laughs> so the bioequivalence is done by giving 600 micrograms of thyroxine. You give it as one dose, fairly big dose, then you do the serum levels. This is how the FDA has told we have to do the bioequivalence. They don't use the TSH or T3 to measure it. And so, and also the FDA has changed in 2007. The uh, potency should be 95 to 105 percent. Before it was 90 to 110 percent. And if you look at some of the uh, articles, there was big controversy, big political issue, New York Times, everyone writing about this levothyroxine bioequivalence at that time. So this is the summer palace of Dalai Lama, and I told you the winter palace is all the way up. I don't know why he has to go climb with the snow and other things all the way top. I would have changed the other way. And this is again used as a museum making money for the Chinese government. So now, Proton pump inhibitors and levothyroxine. And normal pH is between 1 and 2.5 in the stomach. And in the jejunum and ileum, it is more alkaline pH. So if you give PPAs, what happened to the pH? It can be maintained usually between 5.1 and 5.1 and uh, or it is around 4. So the pH is not optimum for the absorption. So there are two studies, at least there are more studies. One is done by the Saraceno. He uh, gave tyrosine. That's the one in the oral solution. It comes in a glycerin preparation and in capsules. You can do this and bypass 
the absorption problem. So if they are on a lot of PPI and you really want to treat this patient, you can try the tyrosine. And uh, so this is one looking at the dissolution of Synthroid, then generic version that's made by Sandoz and Parasit. So this is a very sensitive assay. They used injectively coupled plasma spectrom uh, spectrometry. And if you look at it, the red is using the generic version. It's made by Sandoz. It did fairly well in this study, but the problem is if you write for a generic preparation, there's no guarantee, you'll get the same six months later from the pharmacy. Actually, uh, if you look at the distribution, it's between pH uh, 4 and 6, uh, the Synthroid is only about 20% dissolution, so it's not very good. So remember, the pH is between 4 and 5 with PPIs in the stomach. So whereas tyrosine did fairly well, still it's around 50% dissolution. Now, Bariatric surgery, this is something. Bariatric surgery following they may need increased doses of T4. You know, it maybe has to do with the dissolution or rapid movements, you know, I don't know the exact mechanism. And in this patient, tyrosine may be a good drug. And so this is the hotel I stayed in Tibet. You can look at all the mountains. So Surprisingly, and this is another view of the summer palace of uh, Dalai Lama, and in fact Barack Obama, our president, is going to meet with him in the White House. And of course China already made all the protests. Uh, I was surprised in China there's a mosque, and I visited that. This is around 14, it was built in 1420, and it was built by the uh, Tang dynasty, and he was very open. And there are churches, there are Buddhist, all these things. They didn't destroy any of those things. These are all the versions on the top is from the holy book in the mosque. And this is all carved in stone. It's all intact there. And uh, this is the entrance to the mosque. The mosque is all the way at the back. It's a beautiful place. Actually, that city is very nice. It's called Muslim City in China. I was surprised. And they have Buddhists living in the monasteries. And as long as you don't look at the politics area, they are very happy. You know, they don't <laughs> miss you. And coffee, as I remember, coffee interferes with the absorption. And how does the coffee do that? And this is one study it does, and his, uh, this is done by Ben Wenger studied, and his uh, conclusion was, coffee may retain the T4 within the industrial lumen. So probably it binds to the T4 and make it impossible for absorption. So if you want to bypass this effect, and if you want to take coffee with thyroxine, you can use the thyroxine. That's the one in the capsules. And uh, soft, so you can do that. So you can write that prescription for thyroxine. The problem is I'm going to show the cost of thyroxine compared to the synthroid. What's a good time to give labor thyroxine? Ideally, we give between 30 and 45 minutes. But uh, there are some studies shown, for example, Bork gave the medicine at bedtime and see whether that interferes with the absorption uh, compared to taking it uh, in the uh, morning. So he found actually at bedtime it works much better as reflected by a decrease in the TSH levels. And he extended that study to 105 patients and same conclusion. And uh, retrospective study of 15 elderly patients Midnight versus one hour post break, and TSA decreased slightly. That's all they found. And uh, another study given 30 to 45 minutes at other times. So you can give tyrosine to bypass this effect. And this is one study by, done by Rajput, and uh, he did not find much difference post dinner, two hours. The problem with the post dinner is what do you eat for the post dinner makes difference too. Who knows? If you take a lot of tofu, for example, soy bean, or if you take drink a lot of coffee, who knows, they may, and also if you take some medication, that may affect too. So, and this is one study in which if you look at the first line, and that's a baseline, uh, baseline TSH. This is before breakfast and with breakfast. So, my personal feeling is the best is 
they give it before breakfast, 30 to 45 minutes. And if they really want to drink coffee, if they want to spend money, Paracent is about two and a half dollars per tablet, per capsule. Compared to Synthroid, it's about one dollar. And uh, so two and a half dollars for Paracent cappuccino in Washington area is around three, three, four dollars. So you can spend seven dollars if you want to enjoy the cappuccino with Paracent. So it's much cheaper to take 30 or 45 minutes before. So T3. T3 is available and patients, these days patients are very used to internet. So they study, they print uh, all these review articles and bring to you before they see you. So you have to be careful. T3 is usually used for mixed coma, preparing patients for uh, I-131 or sometimes to attain rapid new thyroidism. There's a preparation thyroid which contains both T4 and T3. And a uh, lot of patients don't like the treatment, Synthroid. You know, approximately it is around, you know, 15 or 20 percent of the patient, maybe 25 percent. And it could be under replaced. Some of the patients may be over replaced and patients don't feel well. So that brings the issue, T4 and T3 combination. Is there anything uh, rational about it or it is just, you know, crazy? Some endocrinologist saying this is a good medication. And the thing is, main feeling is people don't feel well, so let's add some T3. But if you look at the polymorphism, as I mentioned, conversion of T4 to T3 is depending on the D2 and D1. So if there is a polymorphism, if those uh, things are not working very well, the enzyme converting, the adenase, there's a possibility the T3 may not be generated very well. The difficulty is you cannot measure that T3 by measuring the circulation. It is a tissue hypothyroidism. We don't have any good measurement for tissue hypothyroidism. And so T3, you know, if you give T3, a lot of patients feel better. It may be possible, it may be crossing the blood-brain barrier, going to the brain. And T3 may act as a neurotransmitter. It may facilitate the actions of other neurotransmitters, and it is a positive effect of serotonin. So all these theoretical reasons suggest T3 may be a good medication. So if rats are made hypothyroid by, uh, by thyroidectomy or by I-131, T3, T4 monotherapy will not attain uh, tissue hypothyroidism. Uh, we will not attain euthyroid in the tissues. So same way, this is the study, uh, if you look at 25 to 32% of the patients, the T4 has to be on the high levels to normalize serum T3 levels. And same way, and uh, if you give T4 only partial improvement of the neurocognitive st studies. Again, these studies are not very sensitive to pick up the changes. So in one community study done by Saravan, 26%, one in four of the patients with normal TSH while on T4 monotherapy scored significantly worse than euthyroid controls on measures of well-being. So how do you measure it? Again, we have crude measurement. We wish we had a uh, measurement for tissue hypothyroidism. In fact, Dr. Drake worked on looking at some nuclear receptors. You know, we wanted to correlate. It didn't work out very well. But you can look at the mood, cognition, quality of life, patient preference, cardiovascular function and lipid profile, body weight, body composition, energy expenditure, sex hormone binding globulin. Sex hormone binding globulin you can measure because the main reason is it is an action on the liver. So you can look at it as a peripheral effect. But again, any of these studies when you do the uh, difficulty is you cannot just, you know, prospectively order 200 hypothyroid patients, you are going to take this study. And you advertise and patients when they come itself, there are some bias on selection. So this is one study, Benivisha studied and he replaced 50 micrograms of the T4 by 12.5 micrograms of T3. And he included thyroid cancer patient who has more suppressed TSH. So this is not a very good study because thyroid cancer patients are completely different than the plain old-fashioned hypothyroidism. 
Another study done by Savaka, he studied 40 patients and he only took idiopathic hypothyroidism or autoimmune hypothyroidism. He did not include post-thyroidectomy or radioactive treatment and no improvement in depressive symptoms. Another study, this is done a detailed meta-analysis done by Grosinski and Glassberg, Grosinski and Glassberg, 1216 patients. He measured all these things, scores. Depression, anxiety, fatigue, quality of life, adverse events did not differ, and he did not find any benefits. And this is a study done by Dr. Clyde. He was one of our fellows, and now he's my boss in our place. <laughs> he treats me well, I have to say that. So 46 patients were studied. We gave T4 in capsules, T4 and T3 in capsules, and we found no benefits in these patients. And even preference was more towards T4 than T4 and T3. So this is another study by Escobar Morales. He did that. And there is some preference for combined therapy. And there are two other studies which shows some preference. This is one by Saravan and by Applehoff. And so again I mentioned D1 and D2. And if you look at the D2, that's a enzyme which is more in the central nervous system. And that's probably what determines the preference. Here, yeah, central nervous system D2. That's what probably determines the preference for these hormones. So, and there are some polymorphism. For example, there's a CC genotype of RS225014 in 16% of the patients. So, 16%. So, these patients may prefer uh, T4, T3 combination. So, if you look at the summary, there are 17 studies. I looked at all the summaries, and uh, only few of them showed the benefits. So, if you look at the mode cognition, beneficial study showed, then Saravan study showed. And if you look at the patient preference, there are only eight studies addressed it, only four patients, four studies showed the preference. So, if you look at the patient's preference, if you look at it, it varied from 41% to 69%. So again, you know, and body weight change, you know, you lose about 1.7 kilograms when T4, T3. Of course, you can say that may be due to T3 overdosing. And no significant changes in the sex hormone binding globally. So cholesterol, no changes in the cholesterol levels. So atrial arrhythmia is a possibility if you have underlying heart, heart disease in patient and over the age of 40 or 50. So probably polymorphism in the D2, that's the enzyme which is important in the central nervous system, converting T4 to T3 may be very important in this patient. And D2, threonine, that is threonine 92 alanine polymorphism is maybe very important. And already I mentioned about this uh, gene, RS, 22501 and that this patient shows great improvement and this is done by Pranikar, this is done from England actually. Uh, so T4, T3 combination, hypothyroidism resulting from autoimmune thyroiditis, post-thyroidectomy, patient with D2 polymorphism, hypothyroid patient who have depression. But the problem is all the patients feel better the first two months. Only when you see sustained after two months, and especially after six months, you can really say it is working. So, the new treatment of T4 and T3, one is customize the treatment with personal attention. What is the TLC, tender loving care? So you can give three doses, you can try to do it. But even three doses don't mimic the one in the, what the body is doing. it. And there's a sustained release there's some study going on. I think Washington, Ken Berman is doing some study. And genetic polymorphism, if they have the money to pay, so it's not that very expensive to do this test. You'll be very surprised. As you can do, I think, 100 or $200, you can do the test. So this is a monastery at the, in Tibet. And you can see uh, they go three or four times up and down, you know, walking. And sometimes with 30 or 40 pounds in the back. And this is another, that uh, summer palace of the Dalai Lama. So usually we measure four to six weeks, six to eight weeks after the entire hormone. 
but it may take up to four months for the thyrotrophs to attain uh, to normal uh, to normal uh, function. So now comes armor thyroid, desiccated thyroid extract. And remember, this is not kosher. It's made for pork thyroid gland. They take it and then they uh, grind it, and it is made into a powder. In the old days, they used to look by the iodine content. But now they do the T4 and T3. And interestingly, this medicine is still available. The manufacturer continue to make it. And all the societies make fun of this medication. American Thyroid Association, Endocrine Society, and American Association of Clinical Endocrinology. If you give this, they think you are crazy endocrinologists. And there is even a side where they say this is the endocrinologist who will prescribe this medication. <laughs> so, there are some studies since 1920, and one of the studies was done by Jackson, and he did, looked at thyroid extract versus thyroxine, and he found the patients on thyroid extract has some degree of hyperthyroid symptoms. And, uh, and next study was done by Klaus Savin, and uh, uh, he also found some of the patients who were hyperthyroid, uh, when changed to synthroid, they did better. But again, in 1978, the TSH sense, lowest sensitivity level was less than 1.5. So you can imagine. That's, and there is no T3 available. We didn't do routinely T3, no free T4. And so, since 1978, there are no studies except comparing T4 versus thyroid extract. And is it in the days of evidence-based medicine, you are telling thyroid extract is a bad drug without any studies. So that led us to the studies of examining T4 and T3, and this is done by, uh, mainly by Dr. Hong, and uh, he's a Navy endocrinologist now. And the amazing thing is he can work from 7 in the morning till 11 o'clock in the night, six days a week. <laughs> you know, and he never pays attention to the 80 hours rule. So he did this study, desiccated thyroid extract is used. And so we studied about uh, patients between six, 18 and 65 years. And this is all enrolled in the military. And we started with about, uh, number was around uh, 78, and we give the medication in capsules, either to the T4 or T4, uh, the desiccated thyroid exercise in the other one. Patient did not know which one they were getting it. And then we stabilized the dose by the TSH. Then we did the vascular memory test. And it takes about three hours to do one vascular memory test. So you had to do 10 hours for each patient, the memory test. And then we crossed off over and then again did the study. And then we also at the end looked at uh, the preference, whether they prefer one or the other drug. So 78 patients and 70 patients completed the study. And females, of course, they have more hypothyroidism. And these are the baseline uh, parameters. 51 years, cause mostly autoimmune and idiopathic, uh, and post type 131. And dose of thyroid was 112. So it was not a big dose and they have normal vital signs when we started the study. And we measured all these things. Neuropsychological measures was done by Wechsler Memory Test, and I have a copy of that, and if you want to try it on some of your colleagues, you are welcome to do that. And we tried to do our own friends, including the young endocrinologists. They don't do that well <laughs> on that test. And one of the things I think about this is, is you get bored. You know, when you ask some irrelevant type of things, that's what I think about some of these tests. So you can measure all this, we measure all these uh, levels during the three phases of the study, baseline, thyroid extract, and uh, as well as the synthroid. So we did, these are the memory tests, general health questionnaire, thyroid symptom questionnaire, visual world memory index, these are all the personal memory tests. So if you look at it, the heart rate was 74 in the thyroid extract, and T4 was uh, 74. Blood pressure was almost identical, and the weight, actually there was a decrease in the weight by three pounds in the desiccated thyroid extract group. And uh, if you look at it, these are all the memory tests. 
no difference in the memory test between the two groups. So neuropsychological measurements identical. And we look at the TSH in the if you look at the if you look at the uh, thyroid extract, the TSH level was actually a little bit higher, 1.67 compared to the T4. And uh, that this is something very important to remember. Of course, the free T4 will be lower because it has the T3, and T3 le levels are uh, uh, higher in the desiccated thyroid extract. And these are the ones which are significantly different. TSH, free T4, total T4, T3 receptor peg, total T3, and free T4, uh, free T4 by direct dialysis. So no differences in the characteristics of the patient who prefer DT. And so no differences in the neuropsychological measures. Biochemical parameters were identical in the baseline was identical. So this is the dose of the T4 uh, on these patients. And these are the five parameters uh, we measured which predict why they like thyroid extract. Thyroid symptom questionnaires, visual world memory index, T3 resin uptake, free T4, and sex hormone binding globally. We have no clue why this predicts why they prefer thyroid extract. And uh, this is the old conversion published in the PDR. And uh, after we published our report, this is the one now recommended. And up to date, included this, this table right now. So, in conclusion, 49% of the patients prefer DT in, in our study. We have, again, no clue why they prefer it. And 18% prefer T4, no preference in 33% of the patients. And uh, right now, we are trying to do a study looking whether the genetic variations can <coughs> explain this uh, uh, discrepancy the, regarding the preference. So, DT uh, does not cause significant improvement in quality of life. DT costs about three pounds weight loss. Half of the patient exp uh, express the preference for DT or T4. DT therapy may be suitable for some patients. And the other things I always tell our fellows is, you know, some patients demand P DT. Either you can give them DT prescription or you can yourself take Valium, so you have to make the choice. <laughs> so I will prefer <laughs> to give them DT rather than take Valium myself. So this is one paper we did that. There are a lot of over-the-counter medication and made out of medication, thyroid. You know, there's a medication called thyromine, which has thyroid extract and adrenal extract. So patients buy these things, and we had a patient on Graves' disease, so her mother got some uh, this medication and uh, she get aggravation of the hyperthyroidism. Graves disease was well treated with uh, methimazole and uh, we did the serum iodine levels, it, it was sky high. And then this has 10 milligrams of iodine she was taking three times a day. And same way patients have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and hypothyroidism. Stable dose of T4, they are doing very well, suddenly it gets worse. At least ask them the question, what over the counter? And you know, there are medications, don't take any of these medications, just take our preparation, that's what they say. So, uh, ischemic heart disease. I always believe in starting very small dose, something like 12.5 or 25 micrograms, then go every two or three weeks. Because if you reach about 25, 50 micrograms, you can get about 40 to 50 percent improvement patient feel good. So you don't have to go to the full dose even for a patient to feel better. And pregnancy, I mentioned all these things. And in pregnancy, the, there is trimester specific TSH value that is in the first trimester, one and two, second and third, one to 2.5. And if you want to look at that free T4, do free T4 by dialysis. Because Quest has the normal values time stress specific normal values. The free T4, you cannot do it because the kit changes every couple of years and also no one has standardized the treatment. And elderly, this is what I was talking. This is a very important concept 
This is published, uh, written by Serks. Uh, he's in New York. If you look at it, this is, if you look at this, uh, this one, age 80, and there is a shift to the right side. So if you look at the, we level 7.1 or 8 upper limit is normal for the elderly people. So don't treat these patients unless it goes to more than 10 or 15, something like that. In fact, low TSH in elderly subjects is associated with increased mortality rate compared to somebody who has higher TSH. So if you measure your TSH, if it is, you know, when you are 60, 65, it's low, it's not a good sign. And of course, poor compliance, you can give two or three times a week. And the military population, sometimes we bring the patient once a week, give them the tablets, make them drink water, then examine the mouth. We have done that sometimes. So this is the yak in Tibet. I, was, I wanted to go and fetch one of those uh, yak. So the guide with me tells, where do you want me to send your dead body to? Give me your address. <laughs> Sometimes they can attack. And again, this is the medical school. Uh, graduate the military uh, students, about 120 students, Air Force, Army, Navy, and Public Health Service. And this is, McDonald's has come to Xi'an, China. So, <laughs> so this is me in the Tibetan trust in front of the uh, Dalai Lama Palace. So I think this is the old tower built in 1944 by President Roosevelt. So this is uh, the famous National Naval Hospital, now changed to World War III. Okay, now I will stop it. And just a little presentation. Dr. Shakir, thank you for oh, that talk there. Thank we you. enjoyed it very much. Um, just as a memento, of uh, giving the first lecture uh, for this year, we'd like to present you with a desk clock. Oh, okay. You can put on your desk to remember okay. ECU by. Okay. In addition to having your tobacco stick over the door. Okay. Um, I know the time is short. If anybody needs to leave, uh, you're certainly welcome to do so, but we'll take a couple minutes for questions for anyone who would like to stay and ask questions. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you. I have a question for you yeah. that yeah. may be pertinent for some yeah. of the primary care physicians. Yeah. Um, when patients come on uh, arm or thyroid extract okay. and their TSH is low normal, okay. um, particularly the elderly patients, are okay. you concerned at all about the amount of T3 in the arm or thyroid extract and whether or not they could get transiently high T3 okay. levels? Question is whether elderly patients on thyroid extract, if the TSH is on the low side, whether we should adjust the dose. I usually want... I again try to counsel them, you know, about T4 is better. Right? If they don't want to listen, you know, if you stop it, they get very mad with you after a couple of weeks. So I usually split the dose, say 30 milligram, 50 milligram, two or three times a day. I try so they to don't get it. a surge yeah, in T3. Surge in the right T3. After That's after what else. I do it. So that can yeah. be helpful also. Any other questions? All right, I want to announce we're going to go up to the uh, internal medicine uh, library on the third floor of the Brody building. Uh, we're going to present a few cases to Dr. Shakir. We have a little bit of light refreshments. If anyone would like to join us there, you're welcome to come up. Thank you very much. <laughs>